this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying the judgment seat of Christ. This will be part three, Crowns of Grace part three, and I believe the conclusion of this short study. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he uses several analogies to describe how the personal efforts of the Lord's people are coordinated with the labors of others. What you do affects me, and what I do affects you, and, and all this for the fulfillment of His purposes. There's a lot of interesting facts that, that factor into this study of Bema, and I want us to look at those, and then we're going to take a, a really close up look at the original text. One of those analogies, that, well, the first analogy would be, I believe, would be the body and its members which are integrated into a single living organism, the many members acting as one body. We need to factor that into this study. The second is the temple and its stones which are fitted together to form a unified structure. We need to factor that into this study right here in our present study, Paul speaks more directly to the fact in saying that we are God's field. Picture that in your mind. And we are God's building. I want you to picture that in your mind. God's field, God's building. And Paul speaks of the members of the body as being fitly joined, functioning as a whole, Ephesians 4.16, and of the stones of the temple as being fitly framed, Ephesians chapter 2. And so I, we need to consider these facts as we approach this text to, if, if we have any hope of understanding what this is talking about. I believe that we ought to consider the fact that the social and the cultural circumstances into which we were born are under the Lord's control and are arranged to work in conjunction with, with our, our genes, our genetic endowment to produce the kind of person suited to the role that we would later someday come to play within the body of Christ. Folks, these are, are wonderful truths that have to be brought into this study. We cannot look at this passage concerning Bema while ignoring all of the rest of Scripture. And I hope to bring enough into it to, to help us when we come to look at the original text. That's my hope and my prayer for this video. I have struggled with this passage like you would not believe. In fact, I'm more than willing to admit that I have seen where I have been wrong in dealing with this passage in the past, and we'll talk about that. So all of this has been planned from the beginning of the world before we were ever born. In fact, before the human race even existed at all. The personality, folks, that, that we have, that you and I have, is not an accidental byproduct of chance, okay? We don't worship the God of chance. Now, I am also willing to admit that much of modern Christianity does exactly that. But we don't. The personality that we have is part and parcel of a grand design in which a sovereign and gracious God carries forward to completion. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm talking about the plan, folks, that He had from the very beginning. As far as God's elect are concerned, us, His people, His sheep, we are uniquely privileged to be laborers together with God, co workers. 
okay? And that with a measure of freedom. Knowing, knowing that He works in us both the will and do of His good pleasure, Philippians 2.13, and this is possible because as the Lord said to His disciples in John chapter 15, the elect are no longer merely servants, but friends who know what their Lord is doing. The extraordinary thing is that this plan was formulated before the world began. I can't push that point far enough. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, and it doesn't stop there, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption by His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. We read in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because... God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All of this, folks, has to be factored into the equation. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, 2 Timothy 1. And I could go on and on and on, and this would turn out to be uh, an entirely different message. So we were not shaped as a mere byproduct of blind forces, is my point. We were deliberately planned for, even though we were all honed out of the same lump as the, as the non-elect, yet singled out with the divine purpose, always kept strictly in view. Each one of each of us, in this sense, is special. By for, foreordination, elected to a role, a life work, and a course of life divinely adjusted to make end products out of us as God sees fit. Those end products representing our apprehension, as Paul put it, in Christ towards which we are constantly being inclined by His grace. Philippians chapter 3. One of my favorite verses is, is, For you have possessed my reins, that is, formed my inmost being. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Note that. Your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That's, that's a Hebrewism for the womb. Your eyes did see my substance yet being imperfect. And in your book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So how much of our life is by God's ordination? Well, I'd say a whole lot of it. Did not our Lord say, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, John 15. And to what are we ordained? Read the text, folks. To bear fruit. The very thing that we're looking at here. Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has prepared, that is, before ordained that we should walk in them, I pointed out that is the finished work of Christ. Colossians 1.10, we should walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful. There again we see the word, fruitful in every good work. 
all of this, folks, has to be factored in to our present study. I would not be dealing honestly with the text if I did not do that. So here we have a statement to the effect that God has ordained for His children certain good works, certain duties to perform, certain responsibilities to assume, in short, a specific life work, singular, although we, much of modern Christianity and, and many Christians, they commonly uh, assume that fruit means the winning of souls for the Lord, I am convinced that this is not what is meant in Scripture by the term fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, folks, is a, is a portrait of our lovely Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The works which are foreordained that we should walk in them is meant to pr produce character which means to manifest the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives as Paul so often loved to talk about. Even in Galatians 5.22, the word fruit is written in the singular. Okay? And that's in keeping with the fact that the Lord's character was singular, of a, a single piece of a piece the same truth appears in Philippians 1, 1 11. If you want to turn to it and look at it, Philippians 1 11. Although many of the translations have, have blurred that fact by using a plural form, even though in the, in the Greek it shows that it's in the singular. We have the garment of righteousness, which with the Lord clothes the, us, and that, folks, is seamless. We have put on Christ. And the term walk in them surely signifies a life work, singular. So the pattern of life that will be most fruitful will always be precisely that occupation which involves doing the work which God has appointed for the believer. And the whole of Scripture points out just what that is. And because the stones, when we're looking at God's building, this, because the stones are prepared in secret, often in ways undiscovered even by ourselves until afterwards, I mean, only God knows what, what capabilities are hidden in His children. We certainly can't see these things, folks. I mean, certainly Jonah, you know, could hardly have imagined himself as a successful evangelist to the heathen. Gideon was sure he, was, he wasn't the man to do the job that he, he heard God calling him to do. The same is true with Moses, Jeremiah, Paul, David. The list goes on and on. And so it is with you and me. We're, not, we're, not, we're no different. The same is true of you and me. We read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Every man has received a gift. If you look at the authorized version, that's what your text will say. A gift, but there is no definite article in the original text. There's no A there. There's no definite article. And the word gift is not Duran gift. The word is grace, charis. Every man has received grace. That's what, that's what the text says. And you cannot make this stuff up. Now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him? Verse 18. L folks, listen. We must factor that into our present study. The same with the fact that the gifts and the calling, which are both of God, which are without repentance. Hello, okay? Romans 11. Folks, these things, they help us see through this complex passage more clearly. We, 
we will never, this side of heaven, fully understand why God works in the ways that He does. I mean, maybe we'll know the answer to that in heaven. Or we may by then have just simply lost all interest in the question. I don't know. The, the, but the first class conditions here, which I will talk about, and they are extremely important. Extremely important. And I don't know why I didn't catch these in the past. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that. I've got to talk about that. I've got to explain that. I've got to get, make that clearly come across here. The first class conditions should help us understand that the hay, wood, and stubble that is burned refers to each and every one of us since none of us can be all gold, silver, and precious stone. Okay? This study, folks, literally blew my mind. I, I went around for most of my life as a Christian saying, and then look, 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 folks, an entire man, a man's entire life's work can be burned up. You will not find the word entire there in the text. I am guilty of what, what they call eisegesis. That is reading something into the text, something that's not there, which is the opposite of exegesis, which is taking out of the text what is there. And I've, I've, I don't know how many times, maybe a thousand times I've said it, and a, a man's entire life's work can be burned up. Which leaves, the, whoever hears that, it leaves them with the wrong impression that, that it's referring to something that it's not. And I'll talk about that. I hope to talk about that. I hope to help clear that up. I hope that you'll see this in, in the exciting way that I'm looking at it now. It ought to help us to understand that the hay, wood, and stubble that is burned refers to every single one of us, you and me, all of us included, since not one of us can, can be, to come out as all gold, silver, and precious stone, like as if we were perfect and we lived a perfect life and there wasn't any hay, wood, and stubble. That's, that's my point. I consider it more than possible that even if it came to our, even if it did come to our entire life's work being burned where we suffer loss, it's not so much a, a life unfulfilled as it is a cup reduced in size, yet full nevertheless, even running over, which is commensurate to its smaller volume. You've got a small glass, you've got a large glass, both, they're only capable of only holding so much volume, but they're both full to the brim and running over. What a gracious, loving, merciful God that we serve. It seems almost certain that we'll all step into eternity at different stages of, of spiritual mature, uh, maturity, folks. Listen to me. The only thing that we take with us when we leave this world, okay? The only thing. Is, is how we build upon that one foundation, which is Christ. That's it. You cannot, you cannot convince me, you will never convince me, that anything else survives past the death or the rapture. That's it. That's all we'll take with us. How we built upon Christ. And I don't believe that that'll be that, that smaller glass will be a sign of imperfection. You know, to discover in heaven individuals who have achieved different stages of development. The rosebud may be as perfect in its form as the full bloom is perfect in its maturity. And I can also... I can also see God attaching a higher value to that which is less common, less adored. Can't you? We read in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Who makes you to differ from another? And what have you that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? What a comfort 
folks to know that our lot is cast by the Lord, our gifts are of His appointing, our life work planned way back there in eternity. Isaiah in chapter 26 said, Lord, you will ordain peace for us, for you have, listen, you have wrought all our works in us. That's what Isaiah said. Dearly beloved, we cannot look at Bema apart from these many other verses. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2. We cannot factor that out of this equation. We have to carry that verse, folks, those two verses, over into 1 Corinthians 3, into Bema. Bema, Bema. I keep going back and forth. I don't care how you pronounce it, as long as you understand it. So let's look closely at the text. Now, what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to kind of turn it around backwards. I'm going to, go, I'm going to summarize it first instead of going through it and then, and then summarizing it. I'm going to do that first. I'm going to give you a summary up front, up first, as I see this, okay, what I'm seeing in the passage. I believe that we see in this passage the following things. First of all, at the beginning of the chapter, we see the importance of doctrinal purity. We see that we are fellow laborers with God, but we are God's field, God's building. Did He not plant us? We're His field. We're His, we're His building. There are those. I'm looking at those. There, there are those who do who plant. There are those who water. And, and it's, the text says they're one, that, that means of one category, but God causes the growth, the increase. Okay, it's not that we're not one with Christ, but we are one in the sense that we plant, we water, but God causes the growth. God causes the increase. The other day, Sue and I were out in the yard and Sue was planting some stuff in a pot. She planted it. Well, after she planted it, she said, you need to get some water on that. So I put some water on it. So she planted, I watered. Did either one of us, are we going to cause the growth? No, absolutely not. And, and as I pointed out, folks, nature, it's amazing how it reflects the spiritual. God's grace is the underlying factor in it all. We see, we're, going, we're going to see that in the text. Paul says it was by His grace that He laid the foundation. That there's one foundation, that foundation being Christ. And we're to take heed, the word there, take heed, it means to see how we build upon it. And folks, I believe that we are looking at two categories, not six things. Okay? We're looking at that which God did, gold, silver, precious stone, as opposed to what we do in our own strength, hay, wood, and stubble. Two things, not six, okay? Not six. Certainly six things, which represent two realities, two categories. What He did in and through our lives and what we did apart from Him. That's how I'm looking at it, folks. That's how I have to look at it. And of course, the word fire, which we know fire represents judgment. You know, it, now whether that fire at, at Bama is literal or whether it's figurative, I, I can't tell you. I do know that it relates to judgment. And I can tell you for an absolute fact, as I've told you, I don't know how many times that our judgment fell on Christ. We also have to come to this passage with a complete understanding that our judgment fell on Christ. And then there's the order or the arrangement of those things mentioned. Gold, silver, 
precious stone, hay, wood, stubble. The word and is not there. It doesn't say gold and silver and precious stone, hay and wood and stubble. It doesn't say that. It says gold, silver, precious stone, hay, wood, stubble. That's what it says. And this is, this is something that really threw me for a loop, threw my mind into a tizzy here. You know, we know that, it's said, that it is said that after we are tested, we shall come forth as gold. And I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the 15th or the 16th verse, you know, a man's work is burned up, yet he himself will be saved by fire, you know, and. Well, there, there, was, there wasn't any gold, silver, or precious stone, and yet, and I don't know how many times I've, I've, I've even quoted to you folks, you know, how that after he's tested us, we shall, not may, maybe, might, we shall come forth as gold, okay? Now, knowing that there's no contradiction, I had to work through that. The word work is singular. We have three first class conditions. We have to deal with the phrase shall suffer loss as well as the phrase shall be saved. What is saved? Is that, does to save mean redeemed? And of course it doesn't in this passage. The word means deliverance. And we have to consider the fact that all of us are saved. All of us are saved, not just those who suffer loss, folks, okay? I do not believe those who suffer loss are a special group of people, some special group, which I have believed in the past, to my deep regret. And we have to ask, why do some suffer loss if we are God's workmanship? Well, if we're God's workmanship, God's building, God's field, if all of what you've said at the beginning of this video is true, then my goodness, I mean, Steve, how, how in the world can, can we reconcile the fact that some lo suffer such loss and others do not? And that's always bothered me. But I can tell you, no, it, it doesn't bother me any longer. And I hope to explain this. I think we do well by considering the so-called failures of Moses, David, Paul, Peter, you, and me. Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. We know Scripture does not contradict itself. Therefore, I submit to you that there will be gold, even in the worst case scenario here. Okay? And I hope to show that to you folks through these introducing uh, or pointing your attention to these first, all important first class conditions in the Greek, proving that, that there is no contradiction. 1 Peter 1 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 here, the word gold is, is krusos, same word, same word. So we, uh, again, we appear to have a contradiction of sorts. How can it be that one of the things, gold, which remains, according to Peter, perishes? Well, you know, I struggled with that for some time till I realized Peter's gold is literal gold. Okay? It perishes. Paul's gold here in this text is figurative. Okay? Figurative. It's not literal. It's figurative. So, therefore, no contradiction. Psalm 17.3 You have tried my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tested me and found no evil. I don't know how many videos I've made on the new, the, where I mentioned the sinless new man, that his seed abides in us and we cannot sin because we've been born of God. 
tested me and found no evil. So I, I read that, and I'm, and I'm thinking new man. I'm thinking gold, silver, precious stone. Psalm 66.10, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us like silver. Okay, that's interesting. I take from that from that, that silver will remain, just as our text states. This lukewarm church, folks, the church of Laodicea, was one that was redeemed by the person and the work of Christ. They're one of the churches, the letters to the churches. They are God's people. Of course, there's always going to be a mixture of wheat and tare. But the, this is God's people, okay, that he's writing to. And the context regards fellowship, not redemption. Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold. Well, we know that that's figurative. That's not literal. God isn't asking us to, uh, you know, invest our money in gold markets, you know. Refined by fire. Well, interesting phrases given the, the fact of our present study so that you may become rich, white garments, so that you may be clothed in your shameful nakedness not exposed, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Okay, so what's up with the word buy? I mean, with what, with what do we buy this gold? Well, Paul tells us in Philippians uh, chapter 3, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. There's the word loss, same as we see in our text here. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, interesting phrase, considering our present study, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He is speaking of the giving up of all things that would prevent our receiving Christ's salvation as a free gift. Now, when you compare that to Isaiah 55, 1, buy, he says, buy without money and price, everyone that thirsts, Thirsts, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So now I don't have a problem with Revelation 3, 18. Why without price? Well, because it was already purchased for us. Because it's already ours by grace. 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, I think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's hard not to, it's hard to, not to, to read that and, and not see that, uh, the, uh, the necessity for trusting in God in all of our circumstances in that passage. We see how that our relating to God through trials is directly con connected, has a direct con relationship to Bama. First Peter chapter 2, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Well, maybe, maybe the precious stone we're looking at here, which we know is Christ. Proverbs 8, 19, my fruit is better than gold. That's got to be taken literally. Yes, then fine gold and my revenue, then, then choice silver. So it's, it's got to be talking about gold and sil silver in the literal sense. We can see that, I mean, it wouldn't make any sense to, for it to be saying my fruit is better than the figurative gold or the figurative si silver. You understand what I'm saying? We can see that these are not being spoken of as figurative, but literal. And we know that that living stone is Christ. 
Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded unto you. Therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be obedient the stone, which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. In Revelation chapter 18, 12, the word uh, I believe it's argyros in the Greek, silver, which means silver, mean, literally means money. What has real value for purchasing power. Literal. In other words, that which, per which will perish. And figuratively for that which does not. And what, so what has real value for purchasing or redeeming power? Well, the blood of Christ, the work of Christ. So I have suggested in the past, and I have to my deep regret, that what the text is saying here is, is that a man's entire life's work may be burned up. So, you know, there won't be anything survive that judgment. And when the word entire is not there in the text. It's not there. Well, I'm running out of time here, but I want to get to the text. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. We're looking at, at doctrine, the importance of doctrine. But also how God deals it with that doctrine in the lives of people and in, in, of His people and referring to it as milk and meat, what, that which is appropriate to the, any particular believer at any particular time. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as, mere, as men? And while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? You're not a follower of Paul, folks. You're not a, a, a follower of, of Apollos. You're not a follower of Steve. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Okay? I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Every man. Okay? For we are laborers together with God. Is there one believer, folks, that's not a laborer together with God? I would argue no, there's not. Is there one believer who will not receive his own reward according to his own labor, every man, good or bad? And I would say no, there's not. Is there one believer who is not God's field, not God's building? I would argue vehemently that there's not one that is not God's field and God's building. Listen, folks, this gets better. This really does. Paul says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed, that is, see how he builds thereupon. No other foundation can no man lay than that which is presently being laid, that's in the present tense, it's not, it's not the heiress tense, it's, not, it's, it's, it's being laid. It's ongoing. Which is Jesus Christ. And now, verse 12, folks, we see the first word, if. And I'm telling you, and you Greek students out there, you know this, and I should have, I, I knew this, I should have, 
I should have thought of this in the past when I was going through this passage. I guess I just didn't examine it close enough. But a first class condition, the most simple way I can describe it is you have the word, you see the word if, which is followed by a verb in the indicative mood. And any time you see if followed by a verb in the indicative mood, you, you have every right to translate that word if since. Okay, if I'm going to the store and I am. So therefore, since I'm going to the store, I don't know how to put it any plainer than that. And we have three, three first class conditions here in this passage. The first one we see is in verse 12. If any man, since any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Okay, this is what we, we do. It's not a question of will we or should we or it is this is what we do. Since, since any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay? Every man's of what sort it is. What, do, what is that saying, Steve? Is that saying that some will just be all hay, wood, and stubble, and some may, may be all gold, silver, and precious stones? Well, of course not. Of course not. I'm going to have, or at least I, I'll say I hope I have, some gold, silver, and precious stone. I believe I will. But I also believe, folks, that I will have some hay, wood, and stubble. And I also believe that the same is true of you. I also believe that the same is true of every single believer. There will not be a believer who is all hay, wood, and stubble, yet he himself was saved, yet so is through fire. I believe we are included in that verse. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. And I've sure gone around the mountain to get here to tell you that. Verse 15, of course, I'm not there yet. If any man's work abide, since any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. A reward. Since any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as, be fire, as by fire. Folks, I do not see where that the Lord is setting apart a certain category, a certain classification of believers here. That's off. They're different than everybody else. They, it's just all. They're just all hay, wood, and stubble. A man's entire life's work burn up. The word is entire is not there. I, I get a sense, a, a very strong sense here, folks, of the language that the Lord is using here in which He's referring to that which pertains to every single one of us through, through these first class conditions. That it is true of, of every one of us. Verse 12 is true of us. If any man build upon this foundation, well, we do. That's what we do. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work will be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if any man's work abide, since any man's work abide, which it will, which he hath there built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Since any man's work shall be burned, this is not some special classification of some group of individuals here, folks. This, we are included in verse 15. I have to include myself in verse 15. Since any man's work, including Steve's, okay, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as, be fire, as by fire. Folks, we're all saved. Not just this, this, end of this group over here that, that we thought was just all hay, wood, and stuff. Well, they're, they're going to be saved. Yeah. Well, we all are. Do, do, you, do you follow what, where I'm going with this? I, or where I've gone with this? Because I'm pretty much done with this. I mean, this is, this is what we're looking at, folks. I hope that this has helped you somewhat. Uh, it's been a, a great eye-opener to me.
a while back, uh, it's been quite some time ago, I did a video and it was, I was standing out by the, by the, the creek and the, the stream was running, the creek was running, it was flowing in one direction. And, and I, I tried to explain to people how I looked at that, that, that creek flowing in one direction as, as, as God's sovereign will flowing toward God's uh, intended purpose, his purpose, his, you know, you can't change the direction of the current, okay? No matter what you do, and you have you have a mind, you have a will, you have you you you, you perform acts uh, of volition, you do things that, that that get caught up in that current. You know, if you if you kind of look at all the pebbles and the sand and the leaves and the sticks and everything along the bank that gets caught up in the current that's flowing in one direction. That's work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in you both to catch all that up in that current flowing to that one direction. It's God at work in you both to will and do of His good pleasure. You will never change His will, God's will, concerning anything or His purpose. And what we do, folks, in this life gets caught up in, in that work that He's doing. No, it's no wonder we're, we're called fellow laborers. And, I, and I've tried to get you to imagine two different sizes of glasses filled with water to the brim, one smaller than the other, and then the other. Nevertheless, it's, they're both running over. They just have a dip. Uh, the volume is, is, is the difference in volume is, is because of the capacity that's been given them. That we cast our crowns at His feet. We know that. Our capacity, I believe, is... Bama will reflect in the, in the end, in the long run, when it's all said and done, folks, I believe that Bama will, will, will reflect our capacity to manifest God's glory throughout eternity, which every single believer will do because all of the hay, wood, and stubble has been burned up. Nothing's left but the gold, silver, and precious stone. So how we build upon that one foundation is the is the most important thing, folks. The most important thing I, I believe in our in our in our lives. It's how we live, how we walk, how we relate to God with one another. It's how, and this, this especially comes in, is important when it comes to ministry and teaching. True doctrine, sound doctrine. How we've built upon that one foundation, folks. It's the only thing we leave this world with. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your prayers, messages of encouragement, support. Please continue praying for the direction of this ministry. Until next time, thanks for watching.